As Christopher said, I mean, it's a great pleasure to be here to present this work on modeling simulation. Most of the work has been carried out within the framework, but in fact, all of the modeling work you see today has been carried out within the framework of IP Nanoka. Huh? I mean, modeling and simulation in materials covers a vast range, but you'll see even in IP Nanoka, we've covered quite a large range. Huh? So I'll give you a quick outline introduction um, of EPFL, where I come from, a little bit about myself. I'll introduce Uli Ashawa, who will take over halfway through the talk. I do the general blah, blah, blah. He's the man who really does all the hard work and has the brains. Huh? <clears throat> OK. Simulations don't produce ceramics. Why are they important all the same? Huh? Why do we want to simulate? Huh? I mean, we'll talk about aggregates in alpha alumina. I'll repeat the little story that we saw the other day when I, I gave a brief inter introduction to ceramic processing, the uh, conditioning and compounding. Um, later on, we look at the effect of crystal growth. Sintering is just a crystal growth process. Huh? So uh, it's important both in powder synthesis and in sintering. Huh? There'll be a, <coughs> a, a very brief, and this is just to give you an idea of what type of things we can do and where we want to go and where I think we should be going for the future. Then we'll have a, a brief overview of the simulation methods you're going to see today. It's just one slide introducing the various talks that are going to come later, which are all linked to application fields within Nanoka. Huh? OK. EPFL, we saw a little photograph the other day. Um, as we said, I spend most of my hoops, not very good laser here, is this one? No. I spend most of my time in the mountains. This is the lake of Geneva at the weekends. I mean, during the week, I, I work very hard in, at EPFL. Huh? This is the materials department, about four kilometers outside of Lausanne. The materials department, we have polymer group, polymer composite, ceramics, metallurgy, uh, various building materials, and our lab powder technology. I thought I'd give you an introduction to our lab so you see where we come from. Um, we, uh, we're about 27 people. We have some senior staff, support staff, postdocs, a big series of PhD people at the moment, some external collaborators who come to use our specific equipment. And we normally have a couple of students doing short-term uh, stays for three to nine months. So we're, we're a relatively moderate-sized group. What we do, you can find out on our website. If you go to the website, you can see what we do. We work on powder synthesis, powder processing, and sintering. Huh? I mean, uh, we really don't measure properties a lot. If we're going to measure properties, we do that with partners. Um, our basic philosophy is if there's a, a powder technology problem, be it synthesis, processing, or forming, where we think we have a challenge, or we have the know-how to help, we do it, which means we work on a lot of different types of materials. So we work on ceramics, biomaterials, materials for construction, that is the Portland cement that holds up most of the world. Huh? Um, we work on nano-sized materials, powder characterization naturally is very important, um, and we sometimes work on composite materials. All the things in red are the things that I'm involved in, which are a little bit too many, but if during lunchtime or a break you want to discuss something we don't talk about today, then you can see what we're up to at LTP. Myself, I come from a strange country, a little country in Great Britain called Wales. Yeah? Um, yeah? Why strange? Because we speak a very, a very strange language. Huh? Welsh is uh, quite different. Everybody thinks that Wales is part of England. You know, but in fact, it's a British passport. This is the British, the British Isles, and the United Kingdom is Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and Scotland. And there's a British passport, huh? But I come from Wales. I mean, I left Wales <coughs> in 1976. I was 19. I mean, I looked a little bit different then. I mean, my hair was a little bit longer than it is now. Um, 
Wales is not like Spain. Huh? I mean, may maybe Oviedo is a little bit more like this, huh? but Madrid is definitely not like this. Huh? <clears throat> then we see, uh, you know, sometimes we see this patch of blue cloud in Wales, and if you're talking to a British person and they say, oh, the weather's going to be good today, what they mean is you might see some blue sky. Huh? You're not necessarily going to get sunshine, so, you know, if you come from Madrid, you have to be very careful. Okay, maybe Oviedo, we'll see. I've not been there yet. Then I went to uh, Switzerland quite a few years ago, um, and I spent uh, three years as an undergraduate in Imperial College studying physics, did my PhD in the University of Cambridge uh, on catalysis and surface science, spent a couple of years with British Petroleum on applied surface science, and since 1987, I've been at EPFL. So now 22 years I've been in Switzerland, I've become Swiss, I've become Gallo-Swiss. When I left Wales, my, my passions were rugby, beer, music, and physics, and, put, and somebody said to me once, was it in that order? And I said, definitely, you know, you don't drink beer before you play rugby, huh? So my passions since arriving in Switzerland are mountains, wine, dance and powder technology. So if too many people start sleeping, then normally I try and switch on some music and do some dancing. But since I'm not using my computer, I don't have much music, but I might start dancing anyway. Huh? So if you start dancing, if I start dancing, you should look at your neighbor and then wake your neighbor up, otherwise you're gonna get terribly bored watching me dance. Okay, so ceramic processing. We've already had a whole day introduction to this. They come in all shapes and sizes, be, it, be they the hip joints that uh, Jerome was talking about yesterday, or the electronic circuits that we all have in our telephones. And the powder and the processing are key. Huh? I think we've seen that. We can take our, our simple potter's wheel, you know, sometimes we take the powders, we mix it with, with water, we can do a, we can make a piece, we can cast, we know that powder characterization and dispersion, as I tried to outline on Wednesday, are key factors, huh? We, we put these together, we sinter, we reduce porosity, and we form a ceramic, huh? <clears throat> these properties depend on density, microstructure. The microstructure is controlled by the powder surfaces, huh? Yeah? These become grain boundaries after sintering or firing, whether we're dealing with mechanical properties, electrical properties, all transport properties, huh? I mean, they depend on the microstructure, huh? And quite often, I mean, recently these grain boundaries, as was very nicely shown several times, I mean, both in Epicier's, in Terry's uh, presentation yesterday, also in Kaplan's, Professor Kaplan's presentation, this intergranular phase or the grain boundary area is extremely difficult to characterize on a statistical level. To look at one is okay, huh? But you want to look at many. It's really quite difficult. So we have this sur near surface level, which really controls a lot of things in ceramics. Huh? This one to four nanometer level. And like you say, we need simulation to help us, for the, even for the macroscopic models, thermal spraying processes, we need atomistic information too. So we, we want to understand and predict the behavior of a powder, of a ceramic, whatever, a component, we need a whole range of information. Sometimes characterization is too difficult, too expensive, too long, and simulation can help. Huh? We want to be able to predict our behavior, design our microstructures. Okay, so I showed this little example the other day. We have our logarithmic diameter, our cumulative distribution on the log probability plot. We have this tail of agglomerates, these can be either from spray drying, where we have our big defects. The tail of agglomerates gives us these small defects. If we then move into, we do a little attrition milling, we take away this small population. You know, it's about 5% only, huh? Some people ignore the top 5% in a particle size distribution. You take that away and you change the microstructure from something which is very inhomogeneous, with large grains, small grains, same size scale to something that is submicron, high quality ceramic, huh? Just by taking away the small percentage of agglomerates. 
And like I said, transport properties, electrical, mechanical, optical, they're all influenced by grain size and grain boundary composition. We saw the grain size this morning with the photonic effects, how you can change optical properties. We saw Carlos Petra, man yesterday, also illustrate how you change significantly the way that electromagnetic radiation interacts with ceramics with respect to size and also grain boundary composition. We saw that yesterday with uh, Jérôme Chevalier and the mechanical properties, the reduction of size, this dispersion of powders is very important. Huh? So we want the high compact density, we want narrow pore size distribution, we want better microstructures. <clears throat> we can do this to a certain degree with pure powders, but at some stage we, we use dopants. And Professor Kaplan talked an awful lot about, we use MGO to get high density alumina but do we really know why? Huh? <clears throat> One of the things we've done in Nanoka is to try and model a little bit that. We won't talk too much about it today. But how do these influence diffusion constant, solubility, grain boundary segregation? These are things which were discussed in great detail by Professor Kaplan, but we really don't have many replies. Huh? So <clears throat> we think modeling can help. Dopants, quick example, if you take an undoped alumina and a doped, you can see significant difference in the homogeneity, in the grain shape, the grain size. Huh? How do these things work? How can, we, if we understand how they work, we can then use these to create the microstructures we want for the properties we want, okay? So we don't know how it's done quantitatively. They modify surface and grain boundary free energies. Again, something which Professor Kaplan alluded to uh, on Wednesday, we have, in this particular case, we're starting with gamma, we're going from gamma to alpha, we change solubility if we change a phase. This is also the same thing that uh, Jerome was talking about yesterday, with, you know, we have transformation of a phase, you have things which change. Huh? You have different stability long-term with respect to uh, bio-implants, if we have different phases. Huh? Like I said, high resolution and everything is difficult and time-consuming. With modeling, we can get to atomistic resolution, huh? And then we can create the predictive design capacity, which is what we want for the future, huh? <clears throat> I'm not gonna go into the details of how this was done. Some of this will be touched upon by Uli Ashauer in his two talks today, huh? But here we're looking at uh, grain boundary energies, huh? So this is the grain boundary energy, pure alumina for different twin boundaries, huh? So these are just twin grain boundaries. <clears throat> so we have different types of sort of grain boundaries. So we have our grain boundary. Here we have uh, our dopant. Huh? <clears throat> and what we see is, as we put in the dopant, we reduce the interfacial energy. Huh? So we take this example uh, where we, for the, uh, this particular grain boundary, which is quite complex. It's quite a, a large sigma. Huh? So it's not, a, it's not a trivial grain boundary. And we can see there's a significant reduction in the interfacial energy when we use dopants. So we're changing the driving forces for both the growth of the crystals yeah, and the growth of grains in the ceramic, huh? which is what we're always fighting against. Huh? We want to fill pores, but we want to control grain size. <clears throat> if we look at uh, the effect of powder now on a crystal equilibrium shape, so if we take the powder at the beginning, huh? And then we precipitate, I don't know, if you make an alumina, maybe we precipitate an ammonium alum, huh? Then we go through a thermal decomposition, we form a gamma, and then we go from gamma to alpha, we finally have our alpha. Normally the powders are milled afterwards, huh? But when we go through this stage, if we add dopants, where are the dopants when we do this, huh? <clears throat> and what we find, is each crystal will grow to an equilibrium shape to minimize the interfacial energy, okay? Also sintering, we know this is the driving force for sintering of ceramics. This is a view of alumina without <coughs> doping. With 10 ppm yttrium, we can see that the crystal shape, so it means the grain structure is gonna change, huh? As we have dopants which modify the interfacial energy because of segregation to the grain boundaries. Yeah. This is magnesium, you can see a significantly different shape, different optical axes, and as we saw yesterday, 
with Carlos Petra Roman, and I'm sure Uli will also give us a little uh, information on that. If we change the alignment of this uh, birefringent material, we change the relative refractive index. It's very important for transparent ceramics. So you can see we can we can try and perhaps design powders. Yeah? So what we want is grain boundary formation, grain growth. We want to control the microstructure. Huh? So my dream is the perfect powder. Huh? Current powder is what we have. is something that is a size distribution, maybe a shape distribution. We start forming a grain boundary. We've, after sintering, we, we see these nice cubo-octahedric microstructure, but we get defects. Huh? Sometimes we have pores. We get grain growth. This is inhomogeneous because the the size here is perhaps too inhomogeneous. And because of the ideal powder, maybe if we have a powder that's already towards an equilibrium form, huh? <clears throat> then grain growth, the, the driving forces for grain growth is less. The perfect powder is like equilibrium form and small. Huh? And then we can create nice packing, high density. We control the perfect microstructure. 